think let's kick this off. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I see we have around 50 people joining the call. Um, very welcome this morning, or whatever time it is in your region. Uh, it's, my name is Daniel Lapidus. Uh, very happy to have you here uh, for this seminar on, on data visualization. And I wanted to start by just thanking uh, Go210, which is a startup hub in Stockholm, Sweden, that you can see on this image. Yeah, without further ado, I want to get into the game plan or the little breakfast menu that I have prepared for you here today. Um, so we're actually seeing this as a two-part seminar. So today, uh, this Friday, is uh, more about data visualization and data storytelling, like uh, why it matters, and what you can do with data storytelling. So it's, it's uh, open to everyone interested in, in uh, educational data storytelling. And next week, next Friday, we're gonna talk more about these other three parts here in the slide, open data and tools, uh, what we do at Data Story, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about today, but much more next week. Um, and then, both today and next week, there's going to be uh, time for questions. And just some housekeeping notes uh, before we get going. Um, your audio is turned off, and, but there will be a chance to uh, ask questions in the chat by the end of today's seminar. And if there's not time to answer any, everything, I, I hope to be able to get back to you uh, in person or uh, in a blog post where you'll also find uh, all of the links that we look at today. So uh, all of these uh, data visualizations that we're gonna look at, they will be available sometime next week in, in a blog post format. Um, so how can we bring across uh, data to, to uh, different types of audiences. And I mean, there's a lot of theory uh, behind this, uh, obviously, and, and that's not really the, the focus of this talk. Uh, I'm happy to go into that at some other time, but I think some, some of these uh, things are good to have in mind if you haven't worked that much with data visualization. And, and when you look at these visualizations, it's good to have a little bit of a theoretical framework for what you're seeing. So um, data visualizations can be categorized as more towards the exploratory or more towards the explanatory. So exploratory data visualizations that you see online, they often give you a lot of data and you yourself have, the burden is sort of on you to explore uh, what you're seeing and find the patterns yourself. Uh, a little bit like we did, you know, with the school cart on school map example, where that's a typical exploratory uh, type of visualization. Uh, the explanatory, on the other hand, that's where we bring in much more of storytelling and analysis uh, and really guide you through. Um, the explanatory pieces often have an exploratory part, uh, so you'll see a lot of hybrid versions of this as well. Another way you could categorize data visualization is, you know, from small data to big data, whether you're looking at some very aggregated statistics, just like the overall trend, or if you're actually looking at the sort of raw data, like uh, comparing, for example, uh, if you look at income groups in Sweden or something like that, you have, you can either look at 10, split the population in 10 groups and talk about like how are these 10 groups compared to each other or you can look at every single person's income that would be more of the big data approach. Um, then of course you can look at more of the kind of type of data you're looking at. Is it the time series? Are we looking at networks or higher hierarchies of data? And then of course the format that we have chosen to to present this and is it an interactive piece, more of a static infographic, is it a game-like experience or what is quite popular today, this kind of scrolly telling piece where you scroll through the story and there's some animation happening along the way. Um, that's that's uh, some very basic way of, of thinking around data visualization. You could go much deeper into each of those, but I'm gonna challenge you instead to, um, 
think before we go into uh, the actual data visualizations, I want you to think about how you would visualize certain topics. So, um, <clears throat> for example, personality. I mean, there's many aspects of, of personality, but if you wanted to bring out, you know, some unique information about a, a person and portray that in a way, what? How could you go about if you were tasked with that? Your, your brief is to visualize personality, or this is very specific. But let's say you you're working with environmental issues, or you have a river, and um, one example of that is the Ganges uh, River. So, how would you visualize the future of this river, like from a from an environmental perspective, or? Representation in society. I mean, that could also mean many different things. How would you visualize representation? Or GitHub. Uh, all of you might not be familiar with GitHub, but GitHub is a platform where programmers can share code. And some of these mm, communities within GitHub are very, you know, influential and they have many followers. In a way, it's not called followers, I think, on, on GitHub, but they, they, uh, you can track different uh, code bases, etc. So how, how would you visualize this big community or any kind of community this size, you know, Facebook, uh, these huge communities? Uh, or how would you visualize artificial intelligence or the history of the world or the powerful or real time big data? Or finally, the perfect couch for your living room. We're going to end on that little lighter note. We'll have so many very serious pieces. So we're going to end on a little uh, lighter note. And this example actually comes from my colleague, my Brazilian colleague, Vinicius, who I hadn't, I haven't see, uh, hadn't seen that example before, but he showed me last week. Maybe some of you have seen it, but I, I wanted to bring it along. I thought it was a, a beautiful piece. Um, so let's jump into it. So the rest of the presentation is going to be um, more browser based we're going to look at some real examples of data visualizations that that uh, uh, follow what we just saw um, and please if you have any question you can think around uh, about that uh, during the presentation and we, we can come back to that in the q a session um, so personality this is the first example that i mentioned um, i think this is a a beautiful kind of data storytelling piece. It's by Giorgia Lupi, and it's it it's from uh, back end in 2017. And you know this TED conference that I mentioned earlier. It it happens every year, and these participants come there, and they wanted to give them something you know to start talking about when they arrived at the conference. A pin. Um, so what they did here, I'm going to scroll down a little bit here, is that when you came to uh, when you came to the conference, you were asked. I think we can scroll a little bit further down. To the right here, you see some different questions that they were asked. Uh, the participants of the conference: Which TED letter are you? Technology, entertainment, design. When do you get your best ideas? And as you can see, each question had a corresponding pattern where each answer had a corresponding uh, uh, visual and with that they could immediately print out so they did this on an iphone ipad and then immediately they could print out these these pins and have something personal so i think it's it's small data it's something personal it's something very innovative i think it's like a, a conversation starter. Um, so that's that's just one way to to visualize personality, and I, uh, I I hope you can think of other ways and bring this into your uh, maybe organizations. Like how how can we start this conversation? See what we share, what we have in common. Uh, but I'll move on to the next example. The next example is an award-winning piece by the Reuters Graphics, and this is more of an example of what I mentioned, a scrolly telling uh, piece. So the title of this piece is The Race to Save the River Ganges. And as they say here, this river is the water source for 400 million people. Um, and what's really nice, I think, about this piece, why I'm bringing it across here to you is um, 
that it combines so many elements that we need to understand the story. It starts, you know, from the personal stories, the people depending on this source along this river. And then it goes on to show us, uh, this, like, from the Himalayas down to Bangladesh, to the eastern part uh, of India, uh, and what you can see along the way here is that as you scroll, you'll see these monitoring stations. So the whole piece is based on these monitoring stations that measure the quality um, of the water. And we will scroll down further, but what they, what they do very nicely here is that when you start, so what this visual here shows is the, the sewage water, uh, the polluted water, the wastewater that, that comes into the river uh, at different points in, uh, along the way. So to, to your left up here, you have the different states, uh, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, etc. And what they portray along the way is that you have a number of different, you know, paper mills, chemical plants, that all flow out into the to the river. Here you have another very water, uh, polluted river that merges. And by the time you reach halfway through here, you have three billion of liters of wastewater running through here. And we can follow this all the way down. And then um, what they do, and, and this is the nice thing with data storytelling, that you can combine so many pieces of information to tell uh, a complete story. So it might be different to, difficult to relate you know, to that broad river. What does it mean with so much wastewater? Uh, so what they're showing here is what does that, how, how big of a cube is that if you compare that to the Statue of Liberty, which is 93 meters high? Well, it would be a cube which is 182 meters uh, every day and in 30 days it would be this size um, and then they go on to talk about the impact of this but also some of the solutions to this so this is something that I really like when they also talk about you know the solutions journalism part of this like not only the the problem but what is what are researchers trying to do about this and, and people uh, in the region um, so that's um, that's an, an example of a, of a scrolly telling piece combining many different elements of, of data visualization. Now we're going to go to a completely different topic. Um, I mentioned how do you visualize the powerful? Um, let me just see if we got any. Bilden funkar fint. Yeah, someone says that. <laughs> I'm just checking the chat very briefly to see that you can follow through. That's great. Uh, so the next example, uh, the powerful. So this is a pretty cool website and I like how they name their different tools. So uh, it's an NGO, it's called Little Sis. So it's a, it's a, it's a play on, you know, Big Brother. So in, this is your little sister. So if Big Brother is some threatening sort of uh, state uh, level uh, monitoring program, Little Sis is a more grassroots watchdog network as they write here, connecting the dots between the world's most powerful people and organizations. So what they do here on this website is that they, every day they import a lot of powerful people and organizations and how they are all interrelated. And this is mostly US focused, but it's, this is a sort of methodology that could scale to other countries easily, I think. Um, and in addition to just having this database, they have a tool called the oligrapher. Again, a play of words, oligarchy, oligrapher. So it allows you to, uh, it allows anyone basically to, to look at how to, to make their own maps, essentially. So when something is happening, like if, uh, this uh, lawmaking after Citizens United, who is profiting from a certain conflict or something like that, then uh, you can very quickly produce these maps and already have the data about how these uh, companies and people are related. I think it's a, it's a pretty powerful initiative um, that I'm keeping an eye on. Um, 
while at it, I just wanted to show you another uh, story that I worked on a number of years back. It's a, it's a more uh, uh, smaller piece of data journalism. Uh, so I did this work for uh, Swedish TV's uh, data journalism department together with a number of uh, journalists there. And it's in Swedish. It says, where are you on the income scale? Uh, so what we did here is um, we looked at all the uh, tax declarations on, in a given year. So you see the whole background population uh, split into 100 groups, 100 percentiles. Um, so the top percentile of the whole uh, population, they earn somewhere around 114,000 uh, Swedish crowns per month that particular year. This was quite many years ago now. And what it allowed you to do is very quickly compare yourself. Uh, so we went basically from uh, five or six million income tax declarations down to these 100 percentiles and then you could very quickly compare yourself to for example Kvinnor which is uh, women in a particular age group versus men for example uh, in the same age group so you could see some uh, gender disparities here and also age uh, disparities. Um, some, uh, this is a, another way of going about, you know, making smaller, very specific uh, tools. So I would say this, this is a mini exploratory tool. It's, it's more to the exploratory side. It doesn't explain that much, but it's, it's small enough that it's, it gives you perhaps one or two uh, key takeaways, whereas something like Little Sister is very exploratory. Uh, it, it's a big database where... Uh, where you have to browse to find uh, the insights. We have a few more examples, or, or quite a few actually. Um, we're gonna move to another domain, which uh, is near and dear to me, technology. Um, so we're gonna look at two examples from the world of uh, technology. The first one that I mentioned is, is uh, GitHub and these big networks. So how can you visualize a huge community? And I think this visualization is quite fascinating, mostly for the aesthetics. Uh, so what they did here is that they took all of these accounts that you have on GitHub and they built a huge world from it. So you see all of these communities and these players as skyscrapers. Um, so often what you find is that you have like, you know, a, a, a very influential account followed by many smaller accounts. And what's quite cool is, you know, that you see very different patterns. Sometimes you have a huge player and a lot of smaller followers, but sometimes you have what seems to be more sort of egalitarian communities where you have more uh, you know, more mid-level players. Uh, so I think this could apply maybe to, to many other domains as well, where you want to understand, you know, is there someone who has uh, overly much power or, you know, is there some model that seems to work better? Uh, and just learn from studying this community, who is related, uh, what are people working on? There's, there's so much you could do from a, a model like this. They also allow you to search uh, and find yourself in, in this whole uh, tree. Um, so that's, that's how to visualize uh, GitHub. But now to one of the, the, the best pieces that I've come across over the last uh, year. It's from uh, September 17, 2019. And I think you have to go and see this for yourself to watch this video after the talk if you're interested. But let me tell you the gist of it. Um, so this is from an organization called OpenAI, um, based in San Francisco, I think. Uh, it's an organization that is studying artificial intelligence uh, from many perspectives, but one of them is to try to uh, make it safe, you know, as we develop more powerful artificial intelligence, how can we you know, simulate and see that these, this intelligence that we're building is not breaking 
rules or breaking um, certain boundaries. Um, and the reason I brought it up is that I think they've, they've used data visualization or some sort of visualization at least to, to really show us what's going on in these uh, artificial intelligence processes. Um, so what this article shows us is that uh, the whole exercise here is about, we have two so-called hiders. These are the blue characters down here. And we have two red seekers and they are boxed into this, uh, this space. And what, what the artificial intelligence here does is that it uses randomness and learning, uh, this sort of adversarial learning where, you, where they learn from you know, competing with each other to get better at a certain task. And at the beginning, as you can see, <laughs> they don't know very much. So this is what they call episode zero. They, these characters don't really know very much. Uh, they're just moving these boxes, so uh, the seekers are not getting to the hiders. No one is really winning, or you know, uh, nothing is really happening. Then, if you if you play this for a number of million rounds, the seekers they begin to learn to chase these hiders, so they get in here and they they actually win. Um, if you continue playing, and you know, bear in mind that the researchers had no idea what would happen here. They've only given these seekers and hiders some very basic, you know, physical rules like gravity, this room, they collide with the walls, but not, not much more than that. Uh, so by themselves, these uh, hiders, they learn, you know, that in order to, um, to survive, we have to block these doors. So at this uh, at, uh, somewhere around you know five million rounds of this this is what happens and then what well then these seekers start learning how to use this ramp to get into that so again this now the seekers have the advantage if you continue down uh, the path here these these little ones they learn how to steal the ramp so that's the first thing they do very smartly uh, and and even further down, they learn to do that in a certain sequence. So they learn to shift these boxes around so that one goes there, then shifts the box, just so that they have a little bit more time advantage uh, over these ones. And then, so we're at, as you can see, a games play. Then the researchers thought to themselves, well, now this, they can't get much smarter than this, can, can they? So they just let this play for a long, long while. And what happened was that something that they didn't expect further down this one is that, let me just see here, this is where it happens. Here something very remarkable happens, that these learn to surf on top of the boxes. That's nothing that they had predicted that they could even do. So they learn how to surf on the, the, the seekers learn how to surf on the boxes and get into any kind of shelter that the blue ones have built. Um, so I think this is, this is a beautiful way, at least in my opinion, of like, you know, taking this very advanced, you know, neural networks, artificial intelligence and visualizing what happens. So you combine like the best uh, graphics designers, uh, visualizers with the best kind of data scientists. And that's how you can explain how, how this advanced science is actually working. Um, so to me, that, that represents a little bit of the state of the art of, of what we can do with visualization today. Um, a few more quick examples. Um, so we've looked at technology. I wanted to talk very quickly about some real-time big data. Um, and I have a few examples here uh, from different fields. So one of them that I find inspiring is something called uh, world air pollution. I might have to just restart this example. It's on vaqi.info. And it shows you the pollution, different measures of pollution, you know, how many particles of a certain type uh, that, that you find uh, in a particular location. And, and, and a little bit the beauty of this map is that it's based on people's own contributions. So they have a sensor that you can build or buy 
uh, as a person and put that somewhere and then start reporting data back to this map in a common format. So this is the beauty of you know, sharing open data. Uh, so we don't have to necessarily rely on, uh, on a few big players in, in this field, but rather combine the wisdom of this huge uh, crowd. Uh, so that's air pollution, how you can visualize that using real-time sensor data. Um, another project that uh, does something similar, you know, when you combine data from multiple sources is this uh, so-called electricitymap.org, where in real time you can see both the production and consumption of electricity and the, the environmental friendliness of that. So you color countries by right now, for example, how much of different types of electricity are, are we producing in Sweden or uh, in other countries. So what they can do just by these different uh, energy producers agreeing on, on a similar data format, we're able to bring more and more countries into this kind of map. And this is also open data and free for anyone to you know, use and, and explore, uh, build new kind of tools for integrate in their, uh, in their tools. Um, the last example of, of this uh, real-time data that I find fascinating are these sort of traffic maps where uh, <clears throat> because of all our buses and all of our uh, subways, this, we're looking at Stockholm here again, are equipped with the GPS uh, sensors. Um, we can see exactly where they all are in real time. Uh, and I think we'll see more and more of this, you know, these kind of tools to optimize our resource use. So for example, if you know where, if you can very easily, you know, spot where, where our transport is at the moment and, and then, you know, overlay that with where people are or how we move and where we want to go, I think we can we can do a better job at optimizing uh, resources and make make our cities more um, environmentally uh, stable. So that's real time data. So I'll just have one glass of water before we do the last few examples. All right. Um, Another fascinating tool um, is this one. Uh, I'll turn off the sound here. Um, I mentioned how would you visualize the history of the world? And I think this, this tool does it very nicely. It's called uh, Histography, uh, histography.io. And what they've done is that at the bottom here, you have a timeline. So they're using Wikipedia articles that are, uh, that have, um, a year attached to them. So they can do this pretty much automatically, where as you drag here, it will try to emphasize some of the most popular Wikipedia articles uh, from this particular period. So you see um, the Vietnam War, War, World War II, etc. And a very ingenious kind of thing they did here is that as you, if you can see at the bottom of my screen, as you drag back in history, uh, you'll see that the time interval starts being in bigger increments. So first it was like one year at a time, but at a certain point we start going thousands of years or hundreds of years at a time. And this allows us to see all of world history back to when the planets were formed in one single beautiful consistent timeline. Um, so for example, you, of course, if you start from, uh, from the left side, uh, you see the Big Bang. And I think this is something that students, uh, or something that I missed when I went to school, to see you know, this perspective of history. Maybe they do that better in schools today. But I think just having this, this uh, overview that you know, there was the Big Bang uh, for 13 billion years ago. Uh, then not too much happened that was relevant to us maybe. Uh, the first sun-like stars, then over here, uh, 4.5 billion years ago, the Earth is born. Uh, 
And then, you know, we have some significant events like uh, the first sexually reproducing organism that was pretty relevant uh, and a bunch of other things that happen along the way here. But it's, um, it's, it's quite an efficient way to navigate uh, this history and to, to inspire, I think, in, in schools what, uh, what history is about, uh, put things in perspective. Um, so that's histography. Uh, I at Data Story, we, we're, we're about to do some similar tools about culture and, uh, and history. So if you have some ideas, you know, on how we could uh, turn this into even more useful tools or other variations of this, please uh, shoot us an, an email or uh, contact us on social media. And uh, we're, we're really happy to collaborate on, on these kind of ideas. Um, so that's histography. We have a few more minutes. I wanted to leave some for questions as well. So uh, let me just show you one last example uh, and then we can open up to some questions. Um, this is a, a, another beautiful piece uh, called the wind map. So again, more for the aesthetics. It's, it's a real time um, illustration of the wind currents across America. Uh, and I, I would encourage you to visit this website called hint.fm. I'm going to include that as well, but it's by two very famous uh, data visualization practitioners who've been working at Google lately, uh, Fernanda Viegas and Martin Wattenberg. They're very famous in this uh, field. And uh, they've done some more uh, deeper work. You know, they, they've really innovated new types of ways to look at rather complex topics, as we can see here, more in the sort of cultural domains and, and more lately into artificial intelligence. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to share that link with you as well. Um, but I think I'll stop there and open up for any questions about what we do at Data Story or the data visualizations that you've seen. Uh, again, I want to thank Go to Ten for hosting this. Uh, and I want to welcome you back in, in a week again for those of you who might have to run uh, into something new. But we, have, we, can, uh, we can extend the session for another 10, 15 minutes if there are more questions.